all right. So we were talking about um, all kind of very, very theoretical things. Sort of we discussed how work of Kantor led to work of Hilbert, which led to work of Gödel, which led to work of Turing, which led to our sort of daily life programming. So uh, the purpose of this lecture is to show how uh, how these ideas, the ideas which started with Piana, the idea of successor is one of the central ideas which underlies computer science, the notion of iterator. And of course, you probably know by now that if I'm going to talk about iterators, I'm going to start with something completely different. I mean, otherwise it would not be right. So we're going to start with the School of Athens. It's one of the greatest pictures of all times. This is in 16 Chapel, and it's a great, huge picture, not like so, a huge picture of Raphael. Um, and uh, in this picture, Raphael, when describing this sort of the foundational school of humankind, the school of Athens, he gives a picture of two great people, one of whom we talked about. This is the person on the left. But he is actually on the right, being the more senior and more important, important person. I hope you recognize him. This is Plato. And he tells us that we should contemplate eternal things. He points to heaven. And next to him stands his disciple, Aristotle, who says that we should also consider the world. Sort of eternal things are fine, but we need to start our sort of ascent to eternal things, at least according to Aristotle, but actually according to Plato as well, with observing created reality, the universe. And uh, in some sense, these two figures uh, define, define uh, modern world. Sort of in one sentence, sort of you could say that. Plato starts mathematical research. He starts academy, which becomes the center of mathematical research. And whatever mathematics we do goes back to him. Uh, and his disciple, Aristotle, invents everything else. In some sense, if you want to say who started science as we know it, and literally as we know it, the, the modern science starts with Aristotle. So let's talk a little bit about him. And I had to put the stamps there so that you know that at least some societies do acknowledge that he was a great man, Greeks. So um, he was not an Athenian. This is sort of one of the cases that sometimes the school of Athens would take foreigners. Well, they were still Greeks. He was a Greek, but literally barely he was from sort of northeastern part from uh, a little place called Stagira, which was famous for sort of resisting Greeks at, uh, during the Pel Peloponnesian War. And uh, sort of our sum total of historical knowledge of it is that, actually there are two pieces, and I'll start with the first, that uh, Philip of Macedon, the, son, the father of Alexander, burned it down completely and sold everybody into slavery. Uh, I'll give you the second piece of knowledge a little bit later. So uh, as a young man, he goes to Athens and here clearly in search of wisdom. So if you're a young man in search of wisdom, where do you go in Athens? You go to the academy. He enrolls in the academy. He spends probably 20 years sort of till Plato dies as a faithful student, or maybe he becomes eventually an assistant professor, we do not know, but he, he, he is a part of the academy. After that, uh, sort of, he probably, I'm making it up, but he probably expects to be appointed 
after Plato's death to be the president of the academy. He's the bright young thing. Well, he doesn't get it. Plato's nephew gets it. So he is upset or not, we do not know, but he leaves academy, he leaves Athens at that point, and goes and starts a couple of provincial schools uh, here and there. And then he gets a very important appointment. You see, at that time, there are these half barbarous, half Greek people called Macedonians, Macedonians, uh, in the north of, again, in the north of Greece. And they're building this um, empire, which is going to eventually take over the world. But in the meanwhile, it's slowly taking over Greece. And uh, he gets a very important court appointment. He is going to train the heir of the throne. Well, the heir of the throne name is Alexander. So the greatest philosopher of the time becomes a teacher of maybe the greatest, at least, military leader of all times. That's why, I mean, there is a reason we call him Alexander the Great. Uh, so uh, he does a good job. Alexander is clearly brilliant. Uh, you know, he retains one vice. He's a drunk. I mean, he would get drunk very often and probably dies young because of that. So Aristotle was not able to cure him, but in many respects, obviously, did a remarkable job raising him. After Alexander moves on his earth-conquering tour, uh, Aristotle moves back to Athens and starts a new school, a competing school. So for the first time, there are two universities. It's like Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, across the bay, they're slightly on the different sides of, of uh, Athens. Uh, you know about Academy already, that's where Plato, and now his sort of successors, and they're going to stay there for a very, very long 700 years, I mean, unbelievably long period of time. And uh, Aristotle finds a very nice gymnasium over there on the, uh, sort of on the other side, uh, which is called Lyceum, Lucion, Oin. This is a gymnasium dedicated to Apollo the Wolf. So, this is why it's sort of you know, you, you heard of Lyco, sort of things. That's that's what it's called after, and uh, so it's a gymnasium. People sort of do gymnastic exercises, but when they don't, uh, Aristotle starts his school, and the school is known as peripathetic school, because they, from a Greek word which signifies walking. Aristotle wouldn't lecture the way I lecture. He would walk with his students. Right? Uh, interestingly enough, the students managed to write down the notes while he walks. So that was the tradition, his walks in the, in the garden, as it were, and uh, while, while teaching. It's, by all accounts, we, we don't know much, but by all accounts, it's more democratic establishment than, than uh, academy, where students uh, have self-organization. It's more like a medieval university, where there's sort of a guild of students, uh, and they elect their own officers and uh, are in charge of things. So he starts the school, and unlike Academy. Remember, in academy, the center of the study is what? Mathematics. For seven years of mathematics. Math and math and math. Crazy stuff. Aristotle decides that you need to have a program of study. So what does he do? He comes with a catalog of all sciences. So this is utterly amazing thing. I mean, he invents everything rare. I mean, zoology, who invents zoology? Uh, political science, who invents it? He invents it. Physics, who invents it? And you say, well, but he, he made mistakes. Sure, if you invent all the sciences, really all the sciences, you're bound to make mistakes. Right? But it is an astonishing amount of work. And, you know, meteorology, about weather, who invents it? Aristotle. He lectures on everything. And 
you know, he very often he does careful observations and comes with wrong conclusions. For example, he comes up with this Sulfandian principle that every body in motion is going to eventually stop and come to rest. Well, think about it. It does too. I mean, at least, you know, on Earth, when you look around, it seems to be an invariable principle that things come to rest. There are no things which move forever. Right? So he observes it and he says that's, that's how it works. Uh, you know, later on, we, many of his ideas are revised, but the amount of work is utterly astonishing. Right? For example, when he starts political science, and he doesn't do, if Plato would do political science, which Plato never does anything, but he would at least sort of write a beautiful book about what a potentially great state would be. Right? Well, of course, he writes two, and they say different things, just to confuse us. He writes the Republic, and he writes the laws, and they're totally irreconcilable, but that's how Plato is. Aristotle doesn't do things like that. He doesn't say how society should be. He says, okay, I have so many students. Let us do the following project. Let you guys go to different parts of Greece. How many cities do we have? 158, you say. Okay, so we will go to 158 cities and describe their constitutions because Greek states all have different constitutions, different ways they function. Sadly enough, out of 158, only one survives, written by Aristotle himself, Athenian constitution. But it's constitution of Athens. Uh, but again, it's an experimental thing. When his student decides to conquer the world, what does he ask him to do? You know, most people say, oh, give me money. Send me, you know, gold. No, it's not what he asks. He says, send me animals. Because he also, the founder of zoology, he wants to classify all the animals, fishes, birds, whatever. He wants to get them. Right? And Alexander dutifully does. Right? So, but it is an amazing program, sort of, to create a universal, the universe of all the knowledge, whatever the subject, let's study. Or people write drama. Remember, this is Athens. Drama is the most important for, form of art. Let us write the, the principles which the drama obeys. He writes the book called Poetics, which describes the laws according to which classical Athenian drama was written 150 years before, or whatever, 100 years, years before. So he doesn't dictate, he describes sort of the great principles of unity of action, unity of time, and unity of place, which remains as the sort of principle of drama, till effectively Shakespeare was stated, stated by, by Aristotle. So again, the idea is that the man invents science. And this is the great, I mean, you know, it's two greatest books of Aristotle, of course, from now our today's point of view, is his book Metaphysics. He, of course, invents the term metaphysics, something beyond physics. Uh, and uh, the second one is his Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, and uh, this is the most famous sentence, it's Aristotle, which opens the metaphysics. All people, all men, all humans, he uses the word humans, gender neutral word, uh, not andres, but anthrop anthropos. So, uh, desire knowledge again not money not sex not power he says the fundamental human desire is desire for knowledge of course he was greek okay but this is this is for him central thing and again his school is the school of accumulation of knowledge some people who criticize his work say well what he left us is a you know first edition of encyclopedia britannica uh, and it is so in some sense he covered, covered the world. Uh, sad thing is that uh, Plato, as you, well, at least as I told you, wrote dialogues, sort of this beautiful art form, which was like drama, except it was not 
supposed to be performed. At least that's what we think. And amazingly enough, all of them are extant. Nothing perished. Not one. Actually, few were added. There are more of Plato dialogues than he wrote. Uh, but uh, in case of Aristotle, he also wrote dialogues. And by all accounts, very, very beautiful. Well, Cicero says so. Nothing is extant. Every single dialogue by Plato perished. So what do we have? We, well, what was I said? No. All the dialogues by Aristotle perished. So what do we have? We have all the lecture notes. You see? It's like as if I die, as if my great legacy would be Ryan's reminiscences of what I was saying. Uh, that is, we, a lot of them probably were looked over by the master. Some of them are not. You, you could see the difference. But none of his works, of which he was mostly proud, dialogue survives. Uh, snippets do, but you couldn't get any idea, really of how great, great they were. But um, so what does he write? Organon, a great collection of works on logic. We will look more carefully. Physics, metaphysics, ethics, poetics, politics, and goes on and goes on and goes on and goes on. Enormous amount of books. Organon, the logical works. And that's why, why I'm getting, because we need to, to talk about that. He, he writes the six works which define sort of logic for next 2,300 years. It's till the 19th century. You couldn't graduate from reputable university, Harvard, Oxford, places like that, without working through most of these texts. This is the foundational sort of text for, for logic and actually, again, for our civilization. Again, Aristotle remains with sort of on and off the guiding spirit because what happens, of course, the Dark Ages come, the barbarians, uh, so people don't read anything. But very early on, I'm just trying to tell you sort of what happened with Aristotelian tradition. Very early on in 12th century, uh, there is this process in Spain called Reconquista. Spanish, it's a you know, national liberation war. Let us get our Muslim overlords away. So they s slowly sort of reconquer Spain. And in 12th century, they reconquer Toledo. And in Toledo, they find a great library of Arab books. And you know, they. The church sends the translators to translate all this wisdom. And in 12th century starts the first Renaissance. And in some sense, it's Aristotelian Renaissance. A simple way of viewing European culture, 12th century is Aristotelian Renaissance, and 15th century is Platonic Renaissance. Right. So both of them go back to the Greeks, but different Greeks. Aristotle first, Plato second. And uh, mostly they discover a great collection of works of an Arab philosopher from Cordoba. This is in Spain called Ibn Rushd, or as they call him, Averroes. Don't ask me how Ibn Rushd becomes Averroes. That's how, how they would translate it. Uh, who becomes known as the commentator. So in Europe for the next several hundred years, if you say the philosopher, you mean Aristotle. If you say the commentator, you mean Averroes, Ibn Rushd. So in 12th century, the works are translated from Arabic first. And 13th century, the history of Western philosophy in 13th century, the next century, is this struggle with Aristotle of how, because there is this enormous, it's like, Imagine these are people who are trying to rebuild the knowledge, and you drop Encyclopedia Britannica in the middle. They have to put their heads around, and they do. And they're sort of in their great intellectual center, what is the greatest university of that time, 13th century? No, no Frenchman? Yeah, I guess. 
Sorbonne. So, not of in Sorbonne, which is the center of the University of Paris, the center of European intellect, there's this fight about Aristotle. Sort of there are some people who become Averroists. They, they view this, the works of commentator as literally God-given, whatever he says. Then there are people who sort of violently oppose Aristotelianism as sort of dark stuff which will destroy the religion, will destroy all the foundation of society. And then there are people who are trying to combine the both. The, the, name, the main name is who is trying to baptize Aristotle? This is the term. Thomas Aquinas. So by, by the end of 13th century, there is this attempt by Aquinas to create, to take this Britannica and incorporate it in the body of Christian knowledge and sort of create this grand syn synthesis. First, he asked his friend William of Moerbeke uh, to translate Aristotle from the Greek. So this is the first great body of translation from the Greek. And then Aquinas writes extensive commentaries on Aristotle. He attempts to become the commentator still does not displace uh, Averroes, but, but writes very extensive books of commentaries which kept been studying. So in some sense, he baptizes Aristotle. The Aristotelianism becomes the accepted knowledge. So if you go to university, you have to study all this zoology, politics, according to Aristotle, because that is the science. Sort of. Uh, it's a, great, it's a great activity, it's a great activity, but of course, as any activity, becomes eventually a sort of a restraining force for further development. You know, if you codify Encyclopedia Britannica as the source of all knowledge, it's actually bad, eventually. First, it's good. So, but in any case, these were his logical works. And in these logical works, what is the central thing we need to talk about? He introduces the notion of abstraction. In European science, he, he, he sort of, since he wants to do things like zoology, he needs a notion of how to categorize things. So he comes in his book, uh, Categories, he comes with this notion of individual, I think, species some way of form the description, the idea of the thing, and genus, even more general idea. By the way, people ask me, well, why do I call, used to call, before Alexandrescu came about, I used to, the term generic programming, actually invented it. But then it was taken over by my boost friends, so I no longer use it. So, but where did I take the term generic? From genus. Again, from Aristotle. It's operating on genus, not on a species. So what is species? Species is a mental idea which encompasses all essential properties of an object. You say, what's essential? Ah, that's a tricky thing. You have to figure out. But if apparently, like, that's what if the, you know, I am a man, the, the notion of man has to encompass my essential attribute. You have to figure out whether fatness is an essential attribute. And no, it's just accidental. It's an accident. So he comes with this idea of individual species genus. And genus is animal, animal yeah? higher, higher thing than man, and differentia, differentia in English, uh, which is the thing which distinguish men from other animals. And Aristotle says what distinguishes us from animals? Reason. Right? We are thinking animals. Reasonable. I mean, some of us are, I guess. Uh, but uh, again, when you read Plato, of course, Plato would never do that. Guess how he defines a man? Defines man. Featherless biped. 
which is clearly not very essential. He, of course, jokes. I mean, Plato, you could never take quite sort of. So he also comes with the notion of definition, proprium, something which follows from definition but is not part of it, and accident, some property which accidental. Even if everybody possesses it, it's still not universal. It doesn't follow from the definition. Right? So this becomes a center in sort of constructing science. Every science from that point tries to develop this conceptual classification of things according to Aristotelian framework. OK. Now, I have to jump into mathematics. You see, what we need to, to think, rem remember we're talking about set theory and before that arithmetic, before that of geometry. These are examples here. We are trying to apply Aristotelian principle to what we covered. We are trying to classify theories. Of course, nowadays, there's all this confusion what a theory is. They say, oh, evolution is just a theory or whatever. No. Theory <laughs> means something very, very specific, at least mathematically. It, if I say something is a theory, it doesn't mean it's some kind of nonsense. Uh, well, some theories are some kind of nonsense, but not all. Not all. Most scientific theories are not nonsense. But mathematically speaking, when we look at the theory, what do we say? That the theory, this is an amazing sort of thing. We could, for example, apply the language of set theory to theories. You see, there is this, as it were, recursion. Uh, theory is a set of true propositions. We write down everything which we say and that which is true. And that's our theory. You say, well, there could be infinitely many. Oh, we just developed set theory. There could be infinitely many true propositions. Right? So second thing, in this theory, and this is, you, you see how mathematics, and when it becomes metamathematics, feeds on itself. Uh, you know, prior to the sort of um, middle of 19th century, people like Grassmann, invent a notion of a vector space. In the vector space, you have what? A basis, a set of vectors out of which you could build every other vector. Is it? The same thing with the theory. You could have a basis. What basis? These are axioms. You select some propositions. You mark them in red and say, this I take for granted. And then you have rules of inference, operations, like in vector spaces, it's addition and multiplying by a constant. Here, there are inference rules. And you derive more and more and more things. So you could have C with infinitely many propositions, which has a finite basis. Right? For example, we know that C of integers, piano arithmetic, Yes, how many axioms? Anybody remember? Whatever, some axiom. You have to recheck. So if it starts with finite number of axioms, it's always five. Remember, Euclid started with five. Just be hint. Fifth postulate, that's how you remember. Piana had to have five to, to match Euclid. So, but in general, they say, it's like in, in theory of vector spaces, you have finite dimensional vector spaces. What does it mean? Finite basis. So logicians come with the notion of finitely axiomatizable. What does it mean? You start with five. Well, they do not restrict it to five. It could be more or less with some axioms and derive the rest. OK. The basis in linear spaces has to be linearly independent. Every element of a basis should be 
not representable from other elements of the basis, they come up with the same idea. They say, well, axioms should be independent. And they spend time checking that axioms are independent. How do they check? Again, we talked about it when we dealt with Piano, by trying to construct uh, so uh, when you start when you start with a fixed with a fixed set of uh, axioms, what you do, you remove one and try to show that you could have models which sort of do not satisfy it. That's how you show. Then what is a complete theory? Again, complete theory means that for every proposition, you either could prove or disprove it. And consistent means that there is at least one proposition which you cannot prove. One is enough. Well, because you see, if you have two contradictory propositions, then you could prove anything. That's sort of the sad part of modern logic. Uh, like if you prove that uh, Anil is here and Anil is not here, from that follows Riemann hypothesis. I don't see how, but that's, that's, that's how modern logic works. So, for example, this is an example of a theory, something, again, a lot of this, I am just revisiting stuff which we, which we covered before. But now we view it as a theory, so you have operations. You have one constant, you have axioms, and you have theorems. For example, if x times y is equal to x, then y is identity. In other words, there's only one identity element, cannot be two. All right. How do we prove it? Yes, we, we take this, which is given, and we, we multiply both sides by the inverse of x. And it works. And then we prove that the inverse of x times y is equal inverse of y times inverse of x. And you prove it yourself. I'm not going to, but I know how. So uh, again, we have theories and we have a matching thing. We have models. What is a model? Model is a set which satisfies all these propositions. Okay? For a computer scientist, it's a simple thing. It's an implementation. You have some theory, and then you have an implementation of a theory. That's called a model. Right? So the world is now separated into theories and models. Now, of course, you could operate on theories. Like you could refine a theory. What does it mean you define a theory? You throw in more axioms. Or you could throw in an operation. Right? So it's a refinement. And uh, you could construct, if you like, an algebra of theories, sort of operations, operations on theories. Now, eventually, logicians, this development sort of here, I, I just, you know, I wish I could sort of tell you how it happens, but then, you know, there's too much stuff. I cannot teach you everything there is. Uh, I wish I could, but it takes time. So, uh, theory. Remember, theory is a set of propositions. And obviously, we want to look only at a consistent theory, because inconsistent theory doesn't have a model. You cannot implement something which is contradictory. So it's a consistent theory. Is categorical, this is a term which is very important, or univalent if all of its models are isomorphic. Basically, what does it mean? That however you implement it, in some sense, implementations are identical. That is, there is mapping from one implementation to the other where all the things map one to one backwards and forwards. Right? 
This is original definition of categorical theory. Modern logicians do not use it. They use the notion of kappa categorical, which I refuse to introduce here because you're not going to understand it anyway. So, well, I'm joking. You can, but you don't need to. So, but it's a very important thing to know about the notion of categorical because you need to understand one very important principle. Oh, not this one. Uh, the very important principle, I forget where the slide is, but we will get to it, is that the world is like that. You have theory and model. This has proposition. This has many models. If you extend your theory, you put more axioms. What happens with the models? Do you get more models or less? You get less models. You throw more and more axioms, and eventually what happens? You get, get no models because you become contradictory. Right? So the, the process is more, more axioms you have, fewer models you have. More models you have, fewer axioms. This is this, is this process. And for a long time, people thought that we always need to make our theory categorical, that, which is a good thing. You have to fully specify things. Just uh, one of the personal stories. When I was sort of proposing STL, I was getting all kind of negative reaction from all kind of camps, from Mormon church to truly. Mormon church was officially opposed. I am not joking. Uh, they changed their opinion, however. Uh, there was a person called uh, Chuck Ellison who was representing Mormon Church on the standard committee. He, he wrote official memorandum saying, my employer opposes the inclusion of STL into the standard. So you know, I wish I had the, the head written version. I would put it on the wall. Uh, but, uh, and many people who were working on at that time was now the theory of abstract data types. Because they're saying, Alex, all of your things are underspecified. What do they mean? They say, well, you have to make all of your things categorical. And they say, no, no, guys, you are very wrong. You don't. Ignorance is bliss. Fewer axioms you have, better off you are. It's a paradoxical thing, but that's the lesson of modern mathematics. Is actually, it's much better to have underspecified things. You're not committing yourself. If I could get by with fewer axioms, it's so much better. It allows more room for totally different implementations. It's a good thing. But this is, again, notion of categoricity, very important thing. An example. Let's look, remember groups, identity elements, inverse operation, yes? So you could have, let us add an axiom, and you know, I will add it by just saying, let's take a group with one element. How many different groups with one element there are? Well, one happens to be the identity element. Well, it actually must be the identity element as long as the operation is closed. Since you multiply something by something, you don't have anything else, what do you get back? The thing. So, interestingly enough, when you add another element, there's still only one group. Well, there could be actually many, many groups, but they're all isomorphic. For example, let's see two different groups. This is very instructive. Let's look at two different models of group of order two. One model, which everybody should know, is integers, addition of integers, modular two. Have zero and one, yes? But there is another natural model. It's multiplicative group of integers, modular three. There's two elements, you know, one and two. Two times two is one. So they are isomorphic, but they're different models. 
It's just they are different. And again, they're both, you remember what a billion is, yes? Commutative. x times y is equal y times x. Then, what are three? The same thing. Well, it actually all follows from, remember Lagrange theorem? As long as the order is prime, there is only one group, and the cyclic group. Z sub P. So for number three, it's the same thing. Four, lo and behold, we get to this wonderful point. There are two non isomorphic groups. I'll tell you what they are. They're very exciting groups. Right? So at four, we get to a point where even with four elements, there are non isomorphic implementations to different non isomorphic models. Five, we know what happens to five. With six things become truly interesting. There are two models, one commutative, another one abelian and non abelian. Then seven again, things are as expected. Eight, a oh, whole mess. We have three of these, two of those, just lots. Then nine, just two, ten, two, eleven, one, it's prime, and twelve again, we get back to five. And there I stop. I could go on forever. But one has to stop. So, uh, so you observe that sort of it's, it's a funny thing. Sometimes you could have a categorical theory with more elements. That, I mean, sort of when we jump, like six is non categorical, we throw one more element, we increase and it becomes categorical. You cannot. So, let's look at four just, just to. Very instructive. These are two non isomorphic groups of order four. These are, by the way, known as what? Multiplication tables. It's a profound mathematical concept. You see, you have elements E, identity, A, B, C, E. So this is cyclic group Z4, which means what? These are remained as modular four. Just old familiar remainders of modular four, and that's how it is. You add a uh, to a, you get to b. You add one more a, you get to c. You get one more a, you get. It does the cycle. There is another group, a wonderful group known as Klein's group. It's the guy who remember the guy who invented the bottle. Whatever, but uh, he also invented this group. It's called Klein group, and they are different. How do we know? Because multiplication tables look different. Does it prove it? No. Because what we need to show is that no rearrangement of rows or columns and columns will transform this one into this one. This is easy. What do we see? We see remarkable property that here in Klein's group, every element is a self inverse. Look at the diagonal. So everything times everything gives you identity. This is not true here. It's EB, EB on the diagonal. So however you shuffle, they will never be the same. You say, but what is this Klein group? Is it some unnatural thing? No, nothing in life is unnatural. You have to find the models. And there are two beautiful models. This is, I'm just explaining why they're not isomorphic. This property is true in Klein's group, and it's not true in Z sub 4. OK. So here I'm showing different models, different models of Z4. And you know, it again can be an additive group mod 4 or multiplicative group of units mod 5. And how could you map them? What are the isomorphisms? You see there are these crucial elements. Here there are one and three. What are 
makes one and three special? Well, they're both generators. You could generate everything either out of one or out of three, but not out of two. Two generates just it zero in itself. And in multiplicative group of remainder mod five, it's two and three which are generators. So what are possible isomorphisms? Mappings of this, you know, we know that zero has to go into one. We know that two has to go into four. And then you have two choices. There are two isomorphisms between these things. One which takes one into two, one which takes one into three. All right? Okay. Different models of Klein group. Well, the first for simple numeric interpretation. Well, if we take a multiplicative group of units mod 8, it's a Klein group. Because what are the elements? Units have to be co-prime. So these are odd numbers. 1, 3, 5, 7. Observe. 1 times 1, 1. 3 times 3 is 1. It's 9, but it's 1. 5 times 5 is 1. 7 times 7, 48. 9, 48 is 1. So it's, it's, the right, it's the right group. Every element is self inverse. But there is another much better. And of course, for Klein, that's what he wants. He looks at group of mappings of rectangle. Is this a rectangle? Onto itself. How many? Well, let me show you. First of all, one mapping is just this. I don't do anything. The identity element. Then this. You see the picture? Then this. And then combination of both. This. These are four different elements. And all of them are self-invertible. So this, this is sort of mapping of rectangle onto itself gives you a Klein group, which is a very nice thing. I, you know, I had to put some math in. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fun for me. So again, this is what I told you. I didn't remember where the slide was. More propositions, fewer models. More models, fewer propositions. Uh, by the way, somebody says, what do you mean more propositions? There are always countably many propositions. Oh, but of course, when we say more propositions, we're not going to count. We just say, you get more, you get other propositions. Sort of a theory has more propositions than theory A has more propositions than theory B, if it's properly a subs, uh, whichever one is proper subset of the other one is the inclusion. It's not counting. OK. Now we get to programming. Uh, maybe we have a break. This is a good. Let me just show. You know, I have been building it up, building it up, building it up. Why I've been building it up? Because I have to explain to you what concepts are. I say, but we all know what concepts are. Good for you. But you know, it's still a very complicated thing. Many programmers have difficulties. So I'll explain it for those programmers. So when you come back.